If you want to get people of a certain age hot under the collar, just say, baby boomers didn't pay their fair share of taxes. Paul Kershaw recently did that, and he got an earful. But he stands firmly by his view, having put a good deal of work into comparing the circumstances of varying generations. Paul Kershaw is founder of Generation Squeeze, which calls itself a, quote, think and change tank, not just a think tank, a think and change tank. He's a professor of public policy at the University of British Columbia, co-hosts the podcast Hard Truths, and he joins us now here in the studio. Great to see you again. Thanks so much for having me back. Not at all. Let's start with something that, uh, oh, I think you might have written this in the Globe and Mail. Here we go. Shelton, put this up if you would. Finance Minister Krista Freeland emphasized the need for fiscal restraint in her recent budget, but that's not what she delivered in a budget which includes $132 billion in deficit spending over the next five years. This adds about $6,100 in government debt for every Canadian under age 45, most of which pays for spending used by the aging population. Okay, explain that last part to us, the notion that a disproportionate share of the debts being currently incurred are going to be paid by younger people. Yeah, so, and toward an aging population. I think that was the key point I was making mm -hmm. in that in that part of the Globe and Mail article. So if we look in the fine print of the federal budget, which is what I make my business doing as a policy professor, you can see that old age security over the next five years is going to grow by a whopping $86 billion of new spending. Spending on the Canada health transfer is gonna go up by about $50 billion. Around half of that is going to be used by the 19% of the population over 65. When you put those two things together, it comes to about 110 billion. And that means that of the $132 billion in deficit spending, we've probably lost everyone with my math exercise right now. I'm impressed that you're keeping all these numbers very <laughs> cogent, so good but for you. Of that $132 billion in deficit spending over the next five years, 84% of it, the vast, vast majority of it, will go to spending used by people that I love, like my mom, and all of the aging family members in our lives. The spending on that demographic in and of itself isn't the problem. The public finance that is giving rise to routine deficits, having a conversation about fiscal restraint, but not understanding what's making that's impossible, that is creating a big intergenerational tension. Doesn't your mother need that money? Absolutely, my mom needs and deserves to have a financially secure, healthy retirement. So what's the problem? The problem is that on the watch of uh, my mom's demographic and a baby boom demographic, we didn't have the hard conversation about what does it take to pay enough in taxes during your working years to cover the cost for retirement income and medical care you're gonna later wanna use. And here's how I know. So when baby boomers came of age in the mid-1970s, there were about seven working age adults for every retiree. Today, there's 3.3. Now, that wouldn't have been a problem if we designed our tax system to say, oh, during your working lives, we're going to collect from you all the revenue you're gonna to need to prepay for what you'll later use. But that's not how Canada's policy works with the exception of one very important policy, the Canada Pension Plan. In the mid-1990s, our governments recognized, hmm, this baby boomer bulge that we call, it's a real thing, it's gonna pose some challenges. Yeah, prior to the 90s, we paid for our pensions and our medical care as just as the country incurred costs. So when there was relatively few retirees, relative to workers, you could keep taxes low because lots of workers, not a lot of people using retirement income and medical care when we're most fragile later in our lives. But in the 90s, people had, that's gonna bankrupt the Canada Public Pension Plan. Mm -hmm. And they were right. So they actually increased in the mid-90s by 65% what workers had to pay for benefits they would later uh, draw down. But we didn't, we didn't do that for medical care and we didn't do that for old age security. And the provincial budget in 2023 in Ontario and the federal budget this year are really coming to reap those big challenges. So we're still using a lot of services in the boomer generation and sending the bill to our kids. That's exactly right. We are, we are, these are important, important uh, policies, important services to use. An older demographic deserves them, but we haven't had the conversation with them saying, you didn't prepay enough for what you're now wanting to use. And unless we make some adaptations asking, especially an affluent component of the older demographic to start contributing more, there is absolutely no way we are not gonna leave unpaid bills to your kids and grandchildren. Is, is that the same thing as saying boomers are not living within their means? 
Well, that was a that headline came about because when I started talking about the idea that boomers haven't paid enough taxes for what they want to use, I did get some vitriolic emails. You don't say. I did, I did, <laughs> and it started off with a bit of swearing. But when we move beyond the swearing, the the line that the person said is, "I've never taken a government handout. I live within my means." And I'm like, "Well, let me just show you what's happened on your watch in terms of government debt." And government debt, so boomers came of age in the mid-1970s as young adults, when for every person under 45, there was about 10 grand in government debt. If you flash forward to today, there's over 50 grand. Now, there's some reasons why we should you know, massage those numbers, but it is safe to say that on the watch of baby boomers, government debt has uh, tripled at the per capita level when compared to the past. Mm -hmm. And that is a, gotta be a, a clear sign that, hmm, Maybe we organize politics around earning our vote by saying, we're going to offer you more, but not having the hard conversation about, how are we going to pay for that? Well, OK, Canada's almost 156 years old. Haven't we always done that? The generation of today always uses services and sends the bill to the next generation down. Isn't that true? That is true, but that's why the boomer bulge matters so much. The demographics here are, are, are the big challenge. The fact that in, in the mid-1970s, there were seven working age adults for every retiree, and now there's barely three, this is, this is a really big demographic challenge because we didn't do what we, uh, and we did later in the 90s, where we said, oh, we're gonna have a larger demographic of old, older people needing to draw services and so we have to make sure they pay enough for what they're gonna to wanna to use. We never said that. And so the, if we'd had the same number of workers relative to retirees every decade, there'd be no problem whatsoever. But we call them a baby boom for a reason. It's not as if we're surprised by the fact that this large group of people is working its way no, through we're, our, we're, their life cycle. Coming. And so we didn't prepare. And I'm not out here to be mean about that. I'm certainly not trying to shame an older demographic. I'm wanting to invite my mom and all the moms and dads and grandparents out there to say, you want things to be better for your kids and grandchildren. That's not the legacy that's actually being left in a whole range of ways, whether it's public finance or housing or climate change, but there's still time. Let's pick up on housing. Sheldon, top of page two. Can you bring up this chart, please? This is net wealth in housing in Canada. And for those who are listening on podcast, we'll just describe, we're looking at a chart here. It's got four bars. And if you go back to 1977, the amount of wealth that those under 45 and those over 55 had in their homes about the same, essentially the same. If you flash forward, as Paul likes to say, to 2019, you find a huge gap. Those over 55 now have 58% of their income in their principal residence, whereas those under 45 make up only 21% of it. It is a huge gap. Yeah, can I just refine that a little bit? Please. So, in other words, of all the housing wealth that is out there today, mm -hmm. about 60% of it is owned by those 55 and older. It used to be about 40%. And in the back in the day, you had a younger demographic having about a third of the housing wealth. Now they have barely 20%. How so, did that happen? Uh, exactly. So our earlier conversation was about public finance. How are governments investing between young and old alike? And I can share more details about that as we go along. But you might think it's totally fine to ask a younger dem demographic to contribute more now to today's aging population if that aging population was really financially vulnerable and the young demographic was doing fabulously well. But that's not the case. It is exactly the opposite. <laughs> and your bar graphs help to show that. And I think one of the simplest ways to show that the economy doesn't reward hard work for today's young people like it used to is to think about home prices, which we all know, especially in Ontario, has done this. Earnings, shh, done this. What does that mean? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, if you were a homeowner, if you were a nurse or a waitress or a bus driver back in the late 70s, or early 80s, and you bought a home in Toronto or Hamilton, as a regular person could do, the fact that home prices had done this is fabulous. I'm in this. I've been a homeowner in Metro Vancouver for the last 20 years. I gained a million bucks in just the last four years alone. There are many people in Toronto and Hamilton and in London and so on who can make that same observation about gaining housing wealth. So that's increased affluence for an older demographic, push many sort of middle class people into the more affluent categories, but their kids, the exact opposite have. Their kids might have better jobs, more education, but their jobs can't earn uh, incomes that keep pace. And so whereas it used to take five years of full-time work to save a 20% down payment on an average priced home, 
across the country, in this province, even in Toronto, it now takes 17 years across the country. 22 is the average in Ontario. And a whopping, soul-destroying 27 years in the greater Toronto area. So if you're in, it's great. If you're not in, forget it. It is, and but it's not just forget it. Just think about what that means in terms of your sense of almost self-esteem. Like, to some degree, managing to secure housing, whether as an owner or as a renter, is something that one sort of says, like, yeah, an adult should be able to do that. And right now, our economy is making it so challenging for generations of young adults and newcomers of any age to actually make a go of it. Every generation, though, thinks it's hard done by. Do you think boomers understand that if you look at it objectively, they're not so hard done by, as a group. Yeah, I think that that's one of the challenges of the Generation Squeeze work. When, when we started, we were more oriented around trying to bust myths for younger people. You're not struggling because you drink too many lattes or eat too much avocado toast or you have that cell phone. We were showing that the economy simply isn't rewarding hard work like it used to. I think many of a younger, I think the national debate and the Ontario debate is actually more willing to acknowledge that. What we're less likely to acknowledge is actually what's harming hard work paying off for younger people has benefited an older demographic. Mm -hmm. So that's why the articles I've been writing more recently for Generation Squeeze and in the Globe and Mail are trying to probe a little to my mom's demographic, to the retiring baby boomers. I know it's a moment of fragility, especially biologically. We're getting, you know, people are getting older and that it's a biological reality that we're going to experience more vulnerability. But I think for too long we thought the biological fragility goes hand in hand with an economic fragility. But the data are clear. Um, those over 65 had the lowest rates of poverty of any age group in the country, and they have by far the most wealth and more wealth than previous groups of retirees. And so that is what I need in today's older demographic to heed the, the tagline of the Scotiabank, you're richer than you think. <laughs> so what do you want to do about this? Well, there are some policy changes that we desperately need. For example? Mm, but before I can get to the policy changes, oh, so there are policy changes. We are going to need to say, to an older demographic, those of you who are affluent, how can you contribute more to the cost of the, your generation's medical care and old age security? Define affluence. Yeah, that's an interesting question. That's what I was gonna actually say, but what we need to do before that is sort of have a cultural com conversation about who is affluent. So let me start there, because I think that's the more provocative piece. Mm -hmm. We've done some polling recently where we were trying to probe Canadians' understanding of who's economically at risk, who's affluent. And we started with a scenario of, imagine a widow, with an income of just 25,000, has her barely over the guaranteed income supplement living, so really close to low income. Rich or poor? Oh, that, that sounds poor. She lives in a home that she owns, right, owns outright and it's worth a million bucks. People are not so sure now. Imagine the home's $2 million, which is not uncommon in the Toronto area or Hamilton oh, no. area. And like, oh no, that person's rich. Then we swap it around and say, imagine a young lawyer making $200,000. It puts them in the top few percent of income earners in this country. Oh, definitely affluent. They're renting. And suddenly like, suddenly, like, oh, no, that person is less affluent than the widow with 25 grand who owns outright a home worth 2 million. I think we need to be recognizing that an older demographic might not view itself as Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, mm -hmm. but the relative affluence and security that comes with secure housing is something that a younger demographic is feeling really crowded out of and they're being jeopardized by it. How do we make policy if we can't agree on what constitutes affluence? Well, that's why shows like yours are so important. So I guess we need to fund the TVO and get you broadcasting more and more from coast to coast so we can have these more in-depth conversations. That is not why we had you come on but here, but I, you know, I, think I don't mind you saying it. It's worthwhile. Um, but it's, a, I mean, it's, it, I actually didn't mean it to be a facetious question. If we can't agree on if you're trying to shake money out of a tree and you want to get it from affluent people and we can't agree on what constitutes affluence, how do we do it? Yeah. You know, I pride myself as a professor who's not only good with the data, but also someone who's devoted a lot of time to comms and I wish that, or communications, I should say. I, I think this is a challenge. Um, I think it's going to involve some important storytelling and observations, and I tend not to focus a lot on homelessness, but let me bring a story from British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Your, your, your listeners might have seen recently that we had police officers and garbage trucks go down one of our streets in the poorest neighborhood in the country. Uh, and we were removing the tents that people were using to sleep on the sidewalks because this is the part of the population that is most harmed by housing unaffordability and literally do not have a actual structure to sleep in under, uh, other than a tent at night. 
And I find myself at this stage struggling to figure out why is this happening when in that very same city we have printed, we have created more housing wealth there than perhaps anywhere else on the planet. Hmm. And you could say much the same thing about the GTA uh, and the level of homelessness that you experience here in Ontario in, its prime, in our city centre. And so I think to some degree, there's going to, you know, you might be a left of centre person and say, I want to protect those who are vulnerable and I'm going to care for them. You might be those who are like, I don't buy that argument. And it's like, I, I want to be more self-serving. Like, if we lock out an entire generation of younger people who then are out, you know, you lock out the rich lawyer from home ownership and they're competing for the, the rental that the middle class would have used in the past. The middle class go and find the rental that the blue collar worker would have had in the past. The blue collar now goes use the social housing and the social housing isn't available for those on the street. Like it trickles down in an incredibly harmful way and, or cascades, I should say, not trickles. But that can create a great deal of strife. You know, I know people right now on the, the, uh, the Toronto subway are feeling unsafe because of increased levels of violence. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that increased level of violence and unpredictability in a range of places. That is because our economy is not rewarding hard work for a younger demographic, newcomers of any, any age. And so when we have less economic security, you are going to get more crime, more ill health, more friction between groups. And let me take it back to where we started. I just said that our current system of old age security and medical care depends on the largesse, the kindness, the generosity of a younger demographic to pay more in taxes for their aging parents and loved ones than those aging parents and loved ones had to do and take on larger deficits at the same time. If we're gonna ask that of a younger demographic, it's likely only to be sustained if that older demographic says, I understand on my watch, maybe the legacy isn't entirely what I meant to leave. Can I tell you a political reality, though, which I don't have to tell you because yeah. you know it already? But tell me so that we can lament it. Let's, let's, let's have it out anyway. Older people vote, younger people don't. <clears throat> Look at politicians I... respond to political pressure. Older people vote, younger people don't. What are you going to do about that? Crawl under your table and cry? <laughs> I don't think that's going to help not an option. Okay, so now there's two ways. So if you go to the Gen Squeeze website, gensqueeze.ca, you'll see one of the things we're interested in is rejuvenating democracy. And so as we tell hard truths to an older demographic, we also tell hard truths to a younger demographic. Politics responds to those who organize and show up. We are less likely to use our organizing to show up at the ballot box. It is no surprise that politics is then slow to acknowledge these intergenerational tensions. I would say Gen Squeeze could be judged a failure, to be honest, over the last decade at not lighting enough of a fire under a younger demographic to get us more mobilized and using our voter power. So to, to address that potential failure, I, I do find myself more and more reaching out to an older demographic, especially grandmothers. Because they care about their grandkids. And they vote. And so I think right now, there's many an older person who's like, wow, you know, I find myself worried that my kids are not able to provide, you know, the housing security for my grandchildren that I was hoping. I kind of wish they would actually live closer to me than they are, let alone like having access to any kind of rental or with a yard, et cetera. And so I think there's a moment where within families, we can ask our grandparents to start saying, ah, this isn't quite, something is changing, and use that, our, that challenge around the family table at Thanksgiving or whatever our next intergenerational family moment will be, to then say, and what does that mean for our politics? Because we've socialized an older demographic to say, I'm gonna vote for parties based on what more they're gonna do for my medical care and my retirement income. Mm -hmm. We need to socialize those grandparents to say, that matters, but not at the expense of the childcare and education and post-secondary and supports for employment insurance that my kids and grandchildren are gonna need as well. Can that be done? Yeah, because this is not your typical class analysis. I am not here as Tommy Douglas saying a story about all the mice who are haplessly churning the cream that a bunch of fat, rich black cats take and skim off for themselves. That's sort of, you know, cats don't like mice, they eat mice. There's a, you know, there's a, like a, a tension there that's sort of innate. But generations love one another. So I get to start, and I know this is gonna sound hopelessly, hopelessly naive in somewhere, I get to start from a place of love. That love exists around the family table. How can we bring that to the world of politics? Now I have some younger people like, Paul, oh, love, set that aside, take the gloves off, and start saying to boomers, you are leaving problems. And I think that we're trying to find the right balance. You saw, you're referring to the article uh, in the Globe and Mail where, you know, I mean, it took the gloves off a little more to attract that attention. But at the end of the day, there's a love between generations that I think might be the only factor that can really help us disrupt our systems.
and set us on a better path. Because generational unfairness is an underlying disease. We don't talk about the underlying disease. More often, we talk about the symptoms, whether it's climate change, or housing wealth inequality and unaffordability, or the large deficits in public finance and underinvestment in a younger demographic. Those are all symptoms of this generational unfairness as the underlying disease. We need to turn our attention to that because if we, had, if we vaccinate that underlying disease, we can, you know, we can preserve what Canadians hold to be sacred, a healthy childhood, an affordable home, a healthy home, and a healthy planet. My experience in politics is that it does not respond all that well to love, but it really does to fear and hate. Mm. And maybe what you need is a good old-fashioned generation war to make the kind of progress that you want to make. I'm not advocating yeah. it, but I say, I've noticed over the years that tends to be what politics responds to. What do you think? I, I hope not, because I think that if, that is the, if that's the necessary step by which to achieve um, a reorganizing of our policy systems, then it will do a, a decent amount of damage that I would love to avoid. Mm. Um, but I think that we are on track, we are on course for that intergenerational strife. If we don't heed the call right now that we have generational unfairness as an underlying disease, and it will ultimately, um, I think, do the following. A younger demographic is already suffering the ill effects. They're fearful about whether or not the planet will be sustainable. They are locked out of home ownership and, and pay much higher rent as their consolation prize. They are treated unfairly in a way that we don't often acknowledge enough in public finance. So they're already reaping the harms. But if the, if the generational pact breaks down, then suddenly those harms start getting extended to the older family members in our lives who we love. And one of the things that I find most interesting about leading in Generation Squeeze is there is a growing discontent amongst the younger demographic, but they will all start with, I want to protect my parents and grandparents. Hmm. And so I think now is the time to say to a parents and grandparents, you've spent your decades thinking that you're protecting your kids and grandchildren, and it must really, can I say this, piss you off to have a prof come and an organization like Gen Suisse come and say, it didn't work out as well as you'd like. But don't see that as our pitting generations against one another or are trying to shame you. Instead, look at it as our trying to, there's a problem that we together can solve. Time and to take one do, for the team. Time to take, time to acknowledge that it, you value paying for what you use. And all we're asking right now is to pay for what you're using. Younger demographics can figure out to deal with the other challenges they're facing. Paul, you always give us so much to think about when you visit our program, which is why we like to have you on. That is Paul Kershaw, the associate professor at the University of British Columbia and founder of Generation Squeeze, not just a think tank, but a think and change, change. tank, promoting well-being for all generations. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.